Right, moving on to our first panel discussion on ROI with cloud, cloud applications and cloud infrastructure. In, it's an, indeed an honor for me to introduce our renowned panelists. Let's start with our moderator, Mr. Ibu Richardson, Group Director, Transformation and Enterprise Programs Equity Group. Mr. Dominic Kibini, Head of ICT Savala Cement. Mr. Kevin Mulama, Head of Information Technology Octagon Africa. Mr. Vincent Mayoto, Interim Chief Technology Officers, OB Networks Limited. Mr. Andy King, Partner Solutions Arch Architect, SUS. Mr. Samir Kakre, Group Chief Information and Digital of of Officer, FMB Capital Group. Over to you, Mr. Richardson, to moderate the panel, and let's get this insightful discussion started. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, I uh, I prefer to use first names, so I hope it's okay with yourself and uh, my co-panelists. Uh, uh, thank you all very much. Um, let me uh, uh, add to your welcome uh, of this uh, you know very eminent and distinguished set of. Uh, of, of experts who will uh, illuminate all of us uh, on on this uh, this uh, very pertinent topic that uh, that we have to discuss. Um, I I welcome uh, all my co-panelists, but I'd also like to express a, a word of gratitude uh, to the organizers uh, of this very uh, um, topical and uh, um, pertinent uh, program. Uh, but also uh, to our viewers and listeners, uh, and um, you know all the, the, the sponsors as well. Um, let me share some of my own thoughts about this topic, and then uh, I'll start to invite uh, this eminent panel of, of experts uh, to illuminate the audience. Uh, for me, I think you know cloud obviously has been with us for a number of years, and uh, uh, there have been many many organizations that have. Uh, you know, ventured into the cloud you know, because of the promise that uh, cloud brought. Uh, and uh, you only have to look at the size of and scale of uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure to see exactly what cloud is doing uh, as part of, uh, you know, most organizations technology stack that we have, uh, you know, in today's world. Uh, however, some may argue that uh, cloud is yet to really uh, fulfill and, and fully fulfill its, its promise. Uh, in the sense that whilst many organizations are in the cloud and using the cloud, uh, a lot of the uh, return on investment uh, and, and expectations that surround the cloud that were promised probably uh, has not been fully met. Um, I'd like to position that I support that that uh, that assertion to a degree. I think obviously cloud has added a lot of value, but perhaps not fully where um, um, it, it promised to get us to. And uh, maybe uh, as part of this conversation and similar conversations, uh, we'll be able to take cloud exactly to where it promised to be. Um, I'd like to start this panel conversation uh, by getting uh, these experts to, to, to look at that, that promise as a start. So uh, to what extent has, has cloud delivered on his promise. And I'd like to start uh, with that question to my uh, my friend Samir, uh, who can maybe uh, get us uh, started by looking at that particular area for us. So Samir, you know, uh, please uh, uh, illuminate us on, on, that, on that particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Very good afternoon to everyone and to my co-panelists as well. Um, so whether cloud has delivered on its promise or not, I think uh, the very definition of cloud computing was around distributed computing uh, early on, uh, about 20 odd years or so. And, and uh, the benefits which were perceived with cloud computing were mostly around infrastructure management, essentially around scalability, providing provisioning agility, providing storage optimizations, et cetera. And if you take a look at uh, some of the statistics around the space, uh, over the last two decades as clouds become a part of a lot of things that we use on a daily basis as retail users or as part of corporates. Uh, there are statistics around this which point towards a rough 15 to 18% average across the globe, across regions, reductions in IT spending, uh, reductions in IT maintenance effort, and also in the operational cost. Um, which results in about 18 to 20 percent improvement in process efficiencies and time to go live or time to market and, and these 
statistics come from surveys done uh, across industries globally, etc. Uh, and across retail users, across fintech users, across consumer sites which have adopted cloud. Having said that, I think from our region specific perspective as well, cloud adoption has been a bit slow. Uh, and, and, and mainly because of a few reasons, like uh, you know, the understanding of cloud. And when people say cloud, what do they mean? Are they talking about a public cloud? Are they talking about a private cloud? Are they talking about a hybrid cloud? And accordingly, the definitions change. Um, also, uh, regulations and governance around data and security and uh, understanding of that has been a barrier to some industries, especially banking and financial services, which I represent, is highly regulated and that's a barrier. And finally, I think from a regional perspective, uh, the entire reliability and cost of internet or connectivity has been somewhat of a barrier as well. And specifically when you are on a public cloud or you're adopting a public cloud kind of an approach. Uh, these things are improving, but I think these things have been the barrier to achieving the real advantages of a cloud computing or a cloud hosted environment. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Samir. I think uh, that's uh, that's an excellent summary and, and clearly there are some, some key barriers there that are preventing organizations from really maximizing on the cloud. And I think as, as practitioners and professionals, we need to figure out what those things are within our particular organizational context and then try to ensure that we can uh, you know address tackle those barriers so that we can move forward uh, I'd like to uh, go to yourself Andy at this point and, and and really pick up on the question around motivation so what would the motivations be for any organization or business that really wanted to move into the cloud and maybe you can connect that to those barriers or some of those barriers that uh, that uh, Samir has uh, highlighted thank you So, um, Andy, I don't know if it's just me, but uh, we're unable to I apologize. hear you. I apologize. Okay. I was on mute. Um, so, love the question. Uh, there are many uh, motivational reasons for businesses moving uh, to the cloud. You know, there are three main ones. So, critical business events, data center exits. Um, maybe your data center is costing too much and you need to move to a different data center, you know, whether it be your own private data center, your private cloud or public cloud. Um, you know, mergers and acquisitions as, as companies are forming, banks are merging together or acquiring other companies. The existing company could be using the cloud, another company might be. So, you know, you're looking to leverage and, and move to the cloud with that elasticity of uh, on demand and being able to scale very quickly. A reduction in capital expenses. Um, but then we also have migration, so cost saving, reduction in vendor capabilities, you know, moving to a single uh, provider. But my favorite really is innovation. You know, the cloud brings innovation. It allows you to, uh, one, trial different technologies very quickly and efficiently. And when we talk about uh, dev uh, ops or, or development research R&D, uh, the ability to, to spin up a server, test your, your, your software in, in hours or in a day, and then spin it down, turn it off. Those capabilities are now achievable. Um, with the cloud uh, or, or a cloud-like or pay-as-you-go model. And that's what the cloud brings. So innovation, When I love innovation because when you look, and, and as, uh, as within this conference, if we look around and we look around at our partners and our competitors, um, you know, that some might be using the cloud and they have the, the edge, they have the capabilities of bringing innovation, you know, better customer experience, being able to go to different geographical regions quicker, being able to adopt technologies quicker. Um, the capabilities of the cloud brings that. So the motivation to move to the cloud, you really need to align uh, or, or, or look at a business case and a use case for a particular um, use within your company. It doesn't have to be the whole company moving to the cloud. The motivation might be um, you have a, a customer service operation that needs to use cloud features um, that will allow them to use chatbots or allow them to use chat functionality or, or what we're doing today, video conferencing. Um, the cloud brings you those capabilities rather than building them internally. So that gives you the agility, allows you to compete with your competitors, allows you to maybe um, be more uh, innovative as well. So there are many motivational factors and you need to look within those that landscape of 
which one uh, is, is your main priority. But there are many priorities of motivation and, you know, critical business events, migration, or just innovation, being able to compete and being, uh, being a leader, a thought leader within the cloud. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so I think what we now have here is an example or a set of, uh, of examples from Andy on kind of different cloud models. And if you then interlace that or connect that with the barriers that uh, the mayor uh, highlighted on your own, if you can mix that, then you can create a, a, a good way forward. Uh, at this point, I'd like the panel to move on to looking at, you know, how you can maximize different uh, cloud models. Uh, and I'd like to start with Dominic and ask, you know, in, in, in your experience, Dominic, what, what cloud model can give um, if any, do you think can, can offer organizations or businesses uh, maximum benefits? Yeah, sorry. Which, uh, which type of cloud model uh, can really offer organizations the best or maximum benefit? Yeah, okay, sure. So, uh, so fine, yeah. So, we have the various uh, cloud models that have available the uh, ranges from private cloud. Maybe I think maybe I just give a brief of that uh, before I go to the actual and why uh, basically the, the options that I would uh, propose. So basically, so we have the private cloud, uh, which is mainly uh, I think one of the one of the concerns that I've raised by the team is about. The issues of so basically as the name say private cloud basically comes with the, the, the basically the name private means uh, everything is, is basically uh, say for a particular organization the security concerns that are there uh, so basically the need of having most of your information to be like almost like on your prem on on prem uh, setup so so we have private cloud we have a public cloud. So, which cl the public cloud, of course, I think the, issue, the other issue that has also been uh, suggested about is uh, by my other co panelist is the issue of costing. So, with public cloud, uh, so you benefit from the issue a lot of savings of cost. Uh, but of course, you also lose uh, around on security. So, then, so now there's the, the, the option of hybrid cloud, which is now is like a, a mix of the two. Uh, basically benefiting from the private, uh, basically to, uh, ensuring that the sensitive uh, information are secured, and then there's also availability of your data in cloud. So for me, I think it's it's always safe to have a balance of the two, although the biggest driver for me is, uh, in my view, or best practice is, is it depends on the business needs. Uh, sometimes uh, all this private cloud, for example, is very expensive and it's very high to maintain because it uh, requires a lot of uh, expertise, uh, requires a lot of dedicated hardware. It's not like the way you have public cloud, where you have a mix of uh, where you are sharing resources. Of course, the, the, the benefits from the two, but uh, so I think the biggest concern would be is uh, what the business, you, what, what kind of there's so many factors to consider. Be it cost. So if say if you have sufficient cost uh, that uh, uh, to to that department, say that IT department has uh, sufficient cash, then they can maybe they can opt for private. But again, the issues of scalability with private, uh, you have to have dedicated uh, specialist uh, engineers versus public. Again, when you go to public fully on public alone. Uh, there are also a lot of challenges that will come with this in terms of security issues that will come with it. Uh, of course, you have other, say, for example, legal regulations. Say, for, for example, I remember uh, a while back in Kenya, we had an issue that we had a court case in, uh, in an election period where there's a lot of issues with relating to where data was stored. So that's, if you go fully public, you will not be able to get uh, that full benefit. Uh, so basically, I think, the biggest driver for me, I always would be advocate at least a hybrid. So where specific sensitive data can be stored uh, uh, privately, and then uh, then of course to also cut on cost, you can also maybe uh, do a mix of uh, public. Thank you very much, Dominic. So I think uh, you know the summary of what you're saying is is essentially every organization has to view and look at uh, the, their particular context and then 
and then choose the model that will serve their particular interest as well. But of course, uh, the hybrid model then sort of gives you uh, the, the, the best of both worlds, uh, you know, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, so Kevin, let me let me follow up that with you, um, you know, around hybrid cloud uh, and, and pose this question. How, how can hybrid cloud or how can organizations really use hybrid cloud uh, effectively? Well, it, thank you, thank you, Ebo, for that for that question. Um, it depends. It depends with the use case. You'll find that uh, when designing, when deciding what to do in terms of hybrid, you first start with the use case. You'll start with what is the business requirement, uh, what our what, are, what is the institution, what, what what is the customer in this case, even if it's a department, whether in house or externally, what are they trying to achieve? So what is what are the type of business? So you'll find that in, in the case Dominic mentioned, you'll find that um, if 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 the institution is storing something sensitive, then of course you need hybrid. You need purely hybrid. Uh, but then you will then decide how how you want to to layer the hybrid cloud. So you'll you'll find that for you to to do, to to implement a hybrid cloud, you will decide okay. I'll have the data, the database stored privately on my own private cloud, and then the application to be stored on the public cloud. That's the normal, typical model to implement a hybrid cloud. But it depends. You might decide to put the database on, uh, on the public cloud and the application on the private cloud. But it depends on, on the use case. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. And it depends on resources you have. Yeah. Otherwise, it's it's these are these are solutions you can you can, you can pick and choose because it's, think of it, you it enables you to lower the amount of team the, the team you need because most things are outsourced when you implement as when you implement a solution on cloud, in this case a public cloud, you find that most things have already been out, outsourced. You don't need to think of the router. You don't need to think of the hard disk. You don't need to think of the bandwidth. You don't need to think of all these things. All you want, okay, then it depends. Do you want a platform as a service, software as a service? Even cloud has its own different layers on what you want to implement. But that's the, that in general, that's the, the implementation. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. So what I'm hearing from my eminent colleagues uh, on the panel is that, you know, to really do cloud and to do it effectively uh, is a function of the organization and its use cases, uh, because there are different options, different models, and, and how you get the best out of it is specific to the solution architect that you did the solution architecture that you use so that's uh, that's excellent so far um andy earlier on you uh, you spoke about you know the different sort of cloud models and uh, you know how you can go about uh, uh engaging and utilizing them um but i'd like us to to, to move on a little bit further from that and uh, you know the question to you is is essentially um how do, do organizations know or how can they know um, you know, whether they're ready to move into the cloud or indeed whether they're ready for a broader uh, digital transformation conversation? Yeah, good question. So um, there are um, uh, assessments that you can use um, that are known as CARTs, so cloud adoption uh, readiness tools that you can that you can run through. And that will build uh, a picture or a view of where the business is. And these tools are used uh, generally by a lot of partners to, to understand um, whether a company is ready um, and what do they need to be ready. So that is around the business strategy. Um, is the business invested in cloud? Do they have a center of excellence already? Um, you know, development team that are cloud focused, that are skilled and have training. Um, do you, does the company need training? Do they need training like AWS Azure or Google um, to be able to operate um, within that cloud? Have they got a migration plan? What is the business case? Have they done a discovery and assessment and when we look at uh, discovery and assessment, um, really simple, six R's, um, which is a framework around um, you know, making those decisions, whether you want to be hybrid cloud or all in cloud. Uh, all in cloud is very hard. That takes uh, many years. You're either born in the cloud or it takes many years to do that. You know, the reality is 
um, you know, you're going to be operating a, a hybrid cloud of some form. Um, and, and we even talk about edge as well as a new um, place to, to, to where data is held as well. Right. So so edge, private cloud, public cloud um, or retaining um, your your system. So are you going to remove systems? Is it a good time to clean up? Do you need to remove systems, get rid of some old old systems that are no longer needed? Um, are you going to retain systems so they're staying on prem um, part of your hybrid cloud? Are you going to re-platform? Are you going to move to a different uh, platform? Um, Hyper-V, VMware, are you going to move that to e EC2 um, on, on, on Amazon? Um, or are you going to just re-host, lift and shift as is? Um, you're not going to you know, change the model or change the, the, the system architecture. Uh, you might repurchase or refactor, right? So six hours, very simple. You line all your systems and make a decision which one are they going to be you could be removing some, you could be keeping some, re-platform, re-hosting, and that will that will give you that hybrid view of what is going to the cloud, what is going to stay, and what you're going to remove. Um, but overall, you need to do an ass assessment, and your business needs to be ready. Um, they need to have sponsorship within that business. Teams need to be aligned, um, and they need to be all, all, all focusing on that, that one goal. And that goal could be around the hybrid infrastructure, modernizing, digital transformation, um, these all these key words come into play. It's not just about the cloud. It's about as a business. Hybrid cloud is about digital transformation. Um, cloud is just uh, what we say is another person's data center. It's another location. But the cloud also gives you capabilities to bring in other vendors, partners as well. Um, you know, SUSE is one from from a software stance. We have partners that can help you do the hands on and, and, and move migration, whether it's going from Windows to Linux or from Linux to containers. Um, you know, Kubernetes, et cetera, all of these important elements are within your, uh, you know, your assessment and understanding what do you want to do. Um, that's very important within the, the hybrid cloud space. And once again, if you want to be innovative, you want to be agile, if you want to keep up and, and be competitive in the market you are, you need to continually do these assessments. Assessment isn't just a one-time thing. You need to continually do the assessments um, in every area of your business. Um, every, every use case needs to, you need to run through that assessment and make sure that you're adopting every time new frameworks, new technologies, new ideas come out, you're able to, to focus in on those and you know um, develop your, your solutions and, and your business um, to keep up with the ever-changing space that we operate in. Excellent submission, uh, Andy. Thank you very much for that. Uh, perhaps I might even push you to uh, you know, put a, a little framework of your six hours together, maybe share with the organizers so that they can pass it on to some of the participants. Uh, thank you again for that. So, so far we've looked at sort of, you know, whether or not cloud has has, has met its, uh, its promise uh, and uh, the barriers that may have prevented it from doing so. We've looked at the motivations for cloud and some of the key uh, sort of models and, and how we can maximize the cloud. Uh, at this point, I'd like uh, us to move into maybe some of the specific challenges because so far, I think we've looked at the opportunity and the positives, but what are the, the you know, what's the flip side? What are the, the, the challenges that organizations or technology uh, functions can expect when they, uh, um, um, you know, broach the, proud, uh, the cloud, sorry. Uh, and I'd like to start with yourself, Kevin. Um, what, uh, what are some of the typical problems that uh, organizations can expect to face uh, if they endeavor to move into hybrid cloud? Well, yeah, well, it's, it's like any other environment, cloud is, is complex on its own. It depends on what you've implemented. Um, I'll give you an example. When you speak of hybrid and challenges of hybrid, it depends. So you'll find that there's one company which might decide to, imp to outsource the entire, like to host, have a private cloud and a public one. So that's hybrid. Now, for the public one, they might want to outsource the, 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 the DB, yes? You saw as infrastructure as a service, yes? That has its own challenges. But you can even outsource the database on its own as a platform as a service. That means you, you don't have like a physical machine, but you've outsourced. They've, they've already created for you a physical machine on their own. They are maintaining it. They've only given you a way for you to host the, your database somewhere. So you don't you don't have like checking whether the server is on. Like there is a different implementation to hybrid, depending on what you want. So every implementation has its own challenges. But in, in general, 
you will find that uh, the how you implement hybrid if if the implementation didn't have the like the entire function of the company in hand beforehand you'll find that there might be loopholes in terms of security because even there there are things you need to check in terms of um whatever i've implemented is it secure yes yes it's one thing for someone to host it but it's a, diff a different thing to ensure that you whatever you posted there it's secure in, by itself so in terms of the implementation is one thing the next thing i would think it's the cost you'll find that uh, most of most of our cloud architecture we normally pay in usd currently for us for example we are uh, immediately we realize that we are paying 5% more for every for every bill we are paying in usd so we didn't factor that remember we normally plan this thing this is a yearly plan where the, at the end of the year you are you are told give us a plan for next year what what's your entire plan for next year in terms of cost and everything you're going to implement you have your own project plan and then there are things beyond your control if you are using uh, outside vendors people who are outside the country who demand you pay usd those are things beyond you now so some so there are different challenges but most as you expect from local ones you also experience this thing on cloud yeah thank you very much uh, kevin um we've just looked at sort of implementation challenges but of course for many organizations there are also compliance challenges and uh, samir i'd like to come to you uh, given that uh, you mentioned regulation before and also uh, having worked in uh, a heavily regulated industry perhaps you can illuminate us uh, what are some of the uh, compliance related challenges from a, a cloud perspective yeah, thanks for that. Uh, you know, uh, this is perhaps a significant barrier uh, specifically for industries uh, or, you know, areas which are heavily regulated. Uh, and specifically, again, coming from the banking and financial services uh, sector, uh, I often see that uh, the regulations confuse between data security and cloud computing. Uh, and and Typically, they tend to merge both of them and uh, have regulations around it, which essentially from a technology perspective are very clearly two distinct things. Uh, you could have cloud computing as well. Uh, I mean, as Andy said earlier, that you could have a strategy or as Dominic said, wherein you could have a strategy of computing on the cloud, but data storage could be local, etc. So these governance uh, and regulation standards around data governance, data residency, data security uh, need to be explained thoroughly. And, and you know, uh, there is a huge need for uh, education around cloud as well. Um, again, uh, as, as, as I started, cloud started off primarily as distributed computing and storage optimization as a, as, as a solution to that. But today, there are so many variants and definitions of cloud, private, public, hybrid. There is, There are a lot of infrastructure as a service options, which are also marketed and sold as cloud. Uh, there are past solutions, which are said as cloud solutions. So, so there is a lot of complexity. And, and from if you put on your technology hat or if you put on your business uh, or compliance hat, they look like two different problems, essentially. Um, so governance around data, governance around what exactly means is meant by cloud computing and putting regulations around it are very important. Additionally, I think some of the legal challenges as well from the perspective of having the right partner for cloud computing is essential as well. Um, many a times uh, there has been incidents in the past as well wherein migrating from on-premise to cloud is simple. But once you've migrated and in, for whatever reason you have to migrate back, or let's say you have to migrate from one cloud to another or migrate back from cloud to on-premises, uh, you find yourselves contractually and legally caught in uh, a huge mess. And I, I think that's a huge compliance and legal issue as well, which needs to be thought upfront before you get into a cloud service provider arrangement. And I think finally, uh, one of the things which I've noticed uh, uh, is also that most of the applications or the server, you know, the application load which is put or the compute load which is put on the cloud, 
these are intrinsically not cloud ready or cloud native and and what happens is you just end up in an infrastructure as a service kind of a deal wherein uh, it, it's just that your capital expenditure of upfront procuring uh, server etc is just made into an opex deal and and this too if not thought through properly will Hello. end up in additional costs and over a longer run it could prove to be more expensive than just owning and hosting your own hardware so uh, to summarize i think there are three things the first one is around regulations and compliances around defining data uh, related security and cloud computing it needs to be differentiated the second part is legal and contractual obligations when you're entering into a cloud uh, hosting contract with a provider is important and the third part is also evaluating whether your compute load or your application uh, is actually cloud ready or not otherwise uh, in the longer run you will see a cost impact so coming from the compliance regulation angle i think these are the three points which come to mind uh, there could be many more but these are top three thank you Thank you very much, uh, Samia. Uh, that's very illuminating. Uh, Vincent, we haven't heard from you so far, so I'd like to bring you in at this point. Um, I think uh, a lot of the points that uh, uh, both Kevin and, and Samia uh, have, have uh, highlighted, you know, bring us into the realm of security. Uh, and obviously, you know, cybersecurity, information security, very topical at this, at this point in time, uh, and also the need for, for continuity. So let me ask you, from a, a cloud perspective, you know, how should we approach those topics of you know, information and cybersecurity, disaster recovery, and, uh, and, and business continuity? Okay, first of all, we have to admit, East Africa, we have a challenge of connectivity for the end users. Not much of the people have internet, stable internet connection. So even if they're using the the cloud services majority of them are using but not knowing that they're using so that is the challenge they have so when you go to back to security security starts with you first of all for we call it uh, cloud security there are main factors that can affect you as a provider or an end user i can go with simia he said when you are considering taking a cloud service you should have a plan b in case you want to migrate the data, how secure is they? How secure are they providing the tools for you to transfer from server A to the other cloud server in case you have changed the provider? That's one. Two, majority of the security bridges are introduced by the end user, who is the customer or the worker. You've just, I can give an example like uh, you accidentally uh, upload a file to the cloud not knowing that it has a virus in it how will you uh, mitigate that one in future in case it has brought down the the cloud data or the the app how will you mitigate as a, a corporate or a, a company those are the factors you should be considering when educating your end user how to use the cloud and how to uh, to safeguard themselves there's an article I saw over YouTube about the security part. Majority of us use a very weak password. When most of the password are articulated, like uh, I can say, Samia, you can give a password which is your firstborn plus the age. So if I know your family, I can guess your uh, password and try to imagine that you are securing the entire country or the community using that password because it is for you to remember. But forgetting that. The security is paramount to the enterprise you are looking so i was suggesting like uh, whenever you're going for say security and cyber security try at as much as use latest technology like a tokenized uh, password uh, two ties password such that at the end of the day even if you get an attacker from outside you have to be part of the uh, part of the bridge which will be accessed before uh, the, the system or the cloud is brought down. And then there is the data recovery. In case your system goes down, you should be having places, that, uh, backup plans that not only 
uh, you're using one cloud service from one company A, you can have at least two to three, although it's expensive, but the loss and the downtime you'll be avoiding at the end of the day, it will be much more rewarding than taking the entire, entire uh, database or data, secure data you've placed on cloud down without having a backup plan. So I see cyber security is more prone to end user than the system providers because they them they have the resources to put this. So I think uh, we may have uh, uh, lost Vincent for a moment, probably some connectivity challenges, which is ironic because he started by mentioning connectivity challenges in East Africa. Um, uh, we will work him back when he when he comes back, but in the interest of time, I'd like to continue. Um, so we've looked at, you know, the motivations, you know, for cloud, the need for it, and the potential benefits. We've looked at some of the, 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 the possible pitfalls as well that we all need to be cognizant of and, and manage effectively. I'd like to take this uh, discussion towards its conclusion by focusing on on uh, on cost on on the, on the monetary aspects first of all and and perhaps andy uh, you know you you broke the cloud elements down so well perhaps i can tempt you uh, to uh, to help us out with this and maybe samir you can also come in first of all in terms of you know key elements of cost that any uh, business stakeholder any business decision maker can 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 you know, be mindful of what, what would you say are the key elements of of of, uh, of, of cost from a cloud perspective? Uh, first, uh, Andy, and then and then maybe Samir yourself. Yeah, sure. So um, there are two schools of thought uh, on this. Um, you could look at financial operations. So um, when you're actually in the cloud, how do you uh, control costs? So um, cloud services hyperscalers um, generally have a service called reservations. Um, where you can pay up front to reduce your costs uh, up to 70% in, in some cases uh, if you pay up front over five years, as an example. So if you know you need to run a service for five years and uh, rather than do pay as you go, um, pay as you as you grow, consume, um, you could pay up front for that, reducing, reducing your costs. But there's also um, to look at uh, cost management or server uh, management, auto scaling, uh, shutting down test development servers at night. Um, so using automation, background services, um, you know, caching of data, tiering of data. These are all part of the what they call FinOps and management uh, of your servers. And when migrating to, to the cloud as well, cost uh, is important. You might have a server that has 64 gig of RAM and eight CPUs. And because that was a physical server um, build, um, that might not be a requirement. That not, might not actually be its usage day to day across the whole month. Um, when you migrate, you might find you can actually run an eight gig of RAM and two CPUs. So there's a cost reduction and analysis and, and some assessment you need to do before migrating. And that can reduce your costs. Also with moving to the cloud, um, just the server cost is not alone, um, not enough alone. You need to look at what benefits uh, a cloud or, or provider brings as well. So they're bringing in level one, level two, level three support in some cases. Um, so you're removing your operational costs that you have and, the, and you're now gaining that with the cloud for support. And um, whether that be um, infrastructure as a service or SaaS platform as a service, you know, application, um, if you're if you're taking that from a cloud, um, they now have the, the support element. So you now have a support contract, enterprise support co contract with them. So you need to remove that cost as, as well or factor in that cost. Um, you know, physical servers require power and cooling. Um, these are additional costs that you need to factor in as well. How much and you know how much is that costing you on a daily basis, monthly, yearly? What your contracts are? Um, you know there is also premises. You know you need to pay for premises that you're removing some of those costs. So you need to look at your whole IT spend as a whole. Look at each line item, and then when you try to factor in those costs or do a cost analysis against the cloud, um, there are many factors that that, that are unforeseen or unseen. Because um, you're just generally looking at, if we're looking at a, a virtual machine, we just see a virtual machine. But how much does a virtual machine cost to run that internally? So it's an ever-evolving beast. Once again, you need to do analysis. You need to, as you would with monitoring tools or having tools for performance, you need to look have tools that can do that for cost as well. Um, and many of the hyperscalers have those tools. They just need to be enabled, and they'll give you recommendations whether or not you know you need to increase the size of your VM or decrease the size of your VM 
or maybe a VM could be turned off. Once again, you can work with your partners around some of this cost management as well. But as a business case, working with your partners as well to understand your potential costs, you know, your minimums and your highs, um, and then how you can reduce some of those costs with reservations, paying up front, um, purchasing your licenses and in, in using various different models. And um, whether it be upfront or MSP agreement, um, there are different ways of, of purchasing software license agreements as well. Um, but you also open the doors to maybe purchasing that you never had before, being able to, to buy new software at the click of a button uh, via a credit card or a purchase order is now um, a lot quicker than waiting two months to purchase a server and then find out which partner you need to buy from um, and then getting that server and building that server. You know, these are all costs um, that you need to factor in as, right, as well. So your total cost of ownership and your return of investment. How quickly can I get a server up and make the business money? Uh, versus if I was to do that in a traditional manner, going to purchase a server, there could be loss of, of revenue, right? Um, especially if, if, if I'm going to have a website retail that there's a sale tonight and I need to have additional servers, right? What does that cost me? What does that cost the business in sales um, if I can't get that website or keep that website up, right? So SLAs are important as well. Uh, what penalties are there um, if the hyperscaler breaches that SLA? What credits do you get back? Um, some organizations, you know, having network connectivity um, is very difficult. Um, having servers up all the time, um, they, 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 they've been unable to achieve 95% uh, SLA, um, which probably factors uh, 30, 30 minutes a month of, of downtime. Um, they're continually breaching that. When you go to the cloud, you can achieve four nines. Um, so, you know, all the total cost of, 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 you know, excellence and operational efficiencies and benefits um, outweigh some of the costs that you potentially might see as you might be paying more, but you're achieving more, you're getting more back as well. So um, cost is, 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 is one that everyone tries to, to achieve and they, they go in to cloud trying to get the minimal cost. However, you're moving probably from a CapEx to an OpEx. You're actually getting more, you're able to, to achieve more, you have access to more systems, you, you're gaining greater enterprise support, um, you know, your service is going to be up more, you're getting better performance, you're getting the latest hardware in some cases, latest uh, Intel um, CPUs or, 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 you know, NVIDIA if you're doing GPU, etc. So um, you have access to, 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 to the global industry uh, standards that are out there and, and software vendors a lot quicker. So these costs come come with a, with a cost, um, but once again, you're you're moving from essentially capex to an opex, but you can still keep some capex in there and buy up front. So if you're happy to re reserve up front once again, um, then there are dramatic costs you can do. But that is all in your analysis, right? Understanding your usage patterns, understanding, and once again, working with a partner who can do those assessments for you and tell you what direction you should potentially go in and the choices is, is are down to you whether you want to pay um, up front or whether you don't you want to manage those costs over time once again they come with um, some some burden some more operational requirements um, but you know once again it's just understanding those costs having a holistic view on them um, and using tools and assessments and your partners and the community to help you manage those costs Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, so comprehensive, Andy. I don't know if you've left uh, Samir anything else to add, but uh, Samir, do you have anything else to add after that that I'd like to quickly move to a very brief uh, Q&A session before we bring the uh, uh, the discussion to a close? So very well articulated by Andy. Just two aspects of cost which can also be considered. One is around security certifications, which with the right a service provider, you will never be able to build those kind of certifications in-house locally. So I think that's a value add from a cost perspective. And the second one, which uh, Andy also kind of alluded, but uh, in more detail, is around the skilling problem that we have in certain parts of our region. Um, and especially with technology moving at such a fast pace, to get the right skills uh, is a huge cost advantage, which could also be factored in, in an ROI kind of a scenario. And, and just a generic, generic comment, uh, if, if you may, uh, I think just the predictability of costs with cloud enable new business startups and setups at such a high pace because, as Andy mentioned, CapEx versus OpEx, and it just allows you to reduce your upfront investments. And that's a huge enabler from cloud. Thank you.
Excellent, excellent, uh, uh, both uh, Andy and Samia. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to move uh, to the Q and A. Uh, Roger, perhaps I can get some assistance uh, uh, in that regard. You know, you know, to 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 know uh, uh, who amongst our listeners and viewers uh, has a question for the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, I think uh, there is one question. Uh, let me just pick that up. So probably what we can do is. Uh, we do have one question here which talks about they're requesting to throw some light on the compliance challenges and solutions with cloud technologies. So if we can shed some light on that. We have about a minute left. Okay. So in about sure. A minute. Sure. Thank you very much. I think that uh, question was originally answered by uh, by Samir. Perhaps Samir will like to pick that up again, and then maybe uh, if we have a bit of time, I'll uh, I'll request uh, uh, Dominic to to support. But Samir, uh, the compliance challenges around uh, you know cloud uh, investments and cloud operations, uh, please uh, illuminate us. Yeah. So very uh, quickly to uh, state the. Uh, challenges that we face, I think from an industry and from a company perspective, you need to evaluate what your regulations are in your industry. Also, whether you can move seamlessly from a service provider perspective to the cloud and back and contractually as well. I think those are the things which you realistically need to figure out before you take a decision on migrating to a cloud for your particular industry. It's very specific to the industry and the company that you are in. Thank you. Yeah, Dominic, uh, anything to add on your side around uh, compliance challenges uh, that you may have uh, uh, encountered or, or experience that you may want to share? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ego. Uh, I think the only thing that maybe I would want to add is the issue of the timely uh, payment of costs because you see when uh, you move, say, from cloud from on prem uh, center to put on cloud. So that means as an organization also you need to have to make sure that uh, the payments are not timely. Otherwise, you also uh, bound to lose your services uh, in case uh, you don't pay the subscription on time. So I think that is the main, also you are, as an organization, you assess yourself. Uh, so that, because we're moving from a capex to an opex. Uh, and basically it is very clear uh, Fully on the cloud, uh, so services have to be paid after. You see, sometimes I see vendors, for example, I see oh, sorry, organizations or customers like ourselves or any other customer locally. Sometimes you even visit some, uh, some uh, we have some discussions with uh, other colleagues in different industries. You get, for example, the chicken because sometimes they might not have uh, maybe they could be both in terms of cash flow or something. So you need to be very, very sure the organization. Uh, as you move to the cloud, you need to also to make sure that, of course, all that is also switched into uh, the entire organization to the finance so that, because uh, you get if any small delay, then it means uh, there will be service disruptions. So that is very key. And then the other issue is, uh, I think, on the, on the compliance is the issue of uh, localization of data. So there are some, <coughs> I've seen uh, some government bodies, for example, that the data must be stored, for example, within a specific uh, region. So that is also a key requirement. So basically, all this boils down to uh, basically as an organization before you move to the cloud, or as you move that then to the cloud, uh, you need to probably scope, uh, look at all the scenarios that you need, for example, the legal requirements, what, for example, especially I think in government bodies or uh, institutions, that is a key requirement where the data is stored, uh, the security of the data is also very, very key. Yeah, I think that it basically goes as an organization, I think it varies from organization to organization. So bottom line is you have to sit through, uh, evaluate the pros and cons uh, before you adopt uh, whichever model, uh, cloud model that you adopt as an organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, so at this time, um, we have, uh, run out of time uh, and uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, 
It has been uh, a very insightful and illumination, illuminating conversation uh, for, for all our viewers and listeners. Let me take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, this eminent uh, set of panelists. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate your insights and I hope that has been helpful to everybody. Um, the only request that I will make of, uh, of the organizers, and I will insist on it if I'm ever involved in these conversations in future, is that there's uh, some gender balance. Uh, I see that we're all guys here. Uh, and maybe uh, we'll bring a, a few uh, ladies to join us on the next conversation. Uh, but uh, um, thank you very much. It has been my privilege to moderate. And uh, Roger, thank you. I hand over back to you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. And uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. We will take that into consideration and I will feed this back to the organizers as well, right? So uh, thank you very much to our renowned panel members, uh, Dominic, Kevin, Vincent, Andy, Samir, and uh, of course, uh, our panel moderator, Mr. Richardson, for the interactive and extremely insightful panel discussion around ROI with cloud, cloud applications and cloud infrastructure. Thank you once again for giving us your precious time for the summit and sharing your unmatched knowledge. I hope all of you have a lovely day ahead. Thank you.